morning, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to see so many people uh, appearing cheerful on a Saturday morning at night. <laughs> so you must have had a good meeting. Let me, my name is Marius Stan. I'm a computational scientist at Argon National Laboratory and uh, a senior fellow at University of Chicago and Northwestern University. I, this is my second time at the uh, training uh, meeting you are having. I've been here two years ago, a very different topic at that time. It was about science and cinema. So this time I'm going to talk about how to evaluate uncertainty of thermodynamic data using machine learning and elements of artificial intelligence. Now what is the problem? The problem we try to solve uh, is quite important. Uh, appeared in the history of humanity several centuries ago, and it has to do with alcohol production. So you may not believe this, we are paid to study and sample alcohol. Uh, in fact, I'm exaggerating to make a point. Uh, one of the first uses of equilibrium phase diagrams was indeed to study boiling points of liquids in order to get vapor phases that had a high alcohol content. And the type of phase diagram that are being used, as you can see in this lower picture, uh, involves melting temperatures uh, of the two components, so A and B. In this case, uh, the mixture, the fermentation uh, liquid that is used to make alcohol, and the vapor. Now, you can tell that whoever drove this that drew this diagram, kind of shaky diagram, maybe had a sample from the experimental side of the project. project. But it is a simple diagram. Vapors up there, uh, the liquid on the lower side, the melting points, and the mixture of vapors of liquid in this area. So not too complicated, you may think. And humans are quite good at drawing all kinds of things, including phase diagrams. This is a binary diagram. Uh, so I'm not going to invite you to revise all your thermodynamics, but if you remember, uh, maybe about learning about phase diagrams, if you have two components, A and B, right, you'll have liquid in the upper part at higher temperature. This is temperature. This is composition. You may have an intermediate compound, like 50-50%, like this one, uh, D. And then there are combination of the neighboring phases, liquid and solid B or liquid and solid A. A and component B and so forth. Humans can, only, can also draw ternary diagrams that are far more complex because you need a triangle to, to present the composition A, B, C, and then a prism to represent the diagram. Temperature goes up. This has been going for quite a few decades. It doesn't seem to be as complicated, although if you go to four components, it's going to be harder to even visualize how a diagram looks in four dimensions. And if you are interested in the, the phase equilibrium in a stainless steel that has 15 or more components, then it is impossible for the human brain to even visualize, understand what the phase diagram looks in, in such a large uh, uh, multidimensional space. So at some point, humans decided to investigate if, if instead of observing experimental data and trying to draw these diagrams, if they could calculate one of them. And humans only benefited from the insights of one of the most remarkable scientists, an American scientist, uh, Gibbs. Gibbs, who is a man who lived in heaven. In case you don't know, he was born in New Haven, Connecticut, spent all his life in New Haven, Connecticut, and died in New Haven, Connecticut. He was a, a physicist, a thermodynamicist, if that word exists. And he made an observation that revolutionized the way phase equilibria and some parts of thermodynamics and kinetics are being uh, understood and used. He said that it is not true that in all cases, the lowest energy, the phase with the lowest energy is the stable one. He made the observation that sometimes mixtures of phases may have a lower energy. And I guess that may, goes for people too. 
right? So two people of very high energy, if they go together as a team, they somehow may get to a more stable state than individuals. It right? goes for soccer teams, goes for research teams, and so on. This observation can be translated into a mathematical representation. Uh, the free energy, so these curves, the free energy of a phase alpha and the free energy of a phase beta that are plotted here versus composition of the two components, A and B, right? So here you have free energy, not temperature. If we look at the chemical potential, chemical potential in a chemical sense is somehow similar to the electrical potential that you're familiar with, that drives the current through your devices when you plug them in an outlet. Chemical potentials drives chemical elements to diffuse in various parts of the system, right? So because chemical potential is a derivative with composition of the free energy, derivatives are equivalent to tangents to the graphic of that function. It is, I think, uh, reasonable to accept that Gibbs law, that the chemical potentials of two elements in all phases should be equal, has an equivalent in finding the the line that is tangent to both free energy curves. So if you find a common tangent to these curves, then you get the chemical potential of component A and component B. And at the intersection of the tangents with the uh, uh, graphics of the functions, one gets the points in the phase diagram. So one has a method now for humans to draw these free energies, do find the common tangents, and calculate diagrams. It's not by observation, by measurements, it's by calculation, by computation. These calculations were very simple in the beginning. You could do them on a uh, uh, calculator if you want, Texas Instrument or whatever you used in, in high school. But then became more and more sophisticated and complex diagrams like this one are now Available. This is hafnium and oxygen. You see, this is more complex than the, the distillation phase diagram that I showed in the beginning. Again, the liquid up there, various phases. I want to draw your attention to hafnium oxide. Very important for gate materials, for uh, dynamically allocated RAM memories, for computers. A few, less than a decade ago, Intel, uh, Cray, and other companies have decided to add to the silicon-based memory materials hafnia because it can improve a number of electrical properties. Low leakage is a certain band gap that is needed at a quantum level to achieve the, the required properties, high K. So hafnia is of technological interest for us, and we would like to understand it. It's a little bit more complicated. Now imagine now that we would add silicon to this, it becomes a ternary, there are so many phases. I'm just, wanna, I'm just suggesting that analyzing phase stability in materials of real interest for computer, computer industry can be quite difficult, and humans alone cannot fulfill all the necessary tasks. So at some point, I don't know if a conscious decision was made or it just happened that humans decided to use machines in a more sophisticated way beyond calculating some numbers or plotting some figures. And that was the era of computer simulations. I'm showing here a molecular dynamics simulation of gallium melting. Just to give you a sense, give you a sense of what computers could do that humans cannot even attempt to. Atoms of, gallium, of galliums that are connected through forces derived from interatomic potentials are in a computational volume placed in a liquid state that will be here to the left and a little bit to the right because we want periodical boundary conditions. And in a more ordered structure, here in this solid. And the simulation will show how at a temperature a bit above melting temperature, gallium melts in your hand. It melts almost at room temperature if you... Uh, and we, we, the simulation will show how the disorder from the liquid phase from this side and this side will propagate into the solid. 
And this is very important to understand. Does melting occur at once in the entire volume of the solid or from the edges? Or how does that happen? So as you can tell, atoms vibrate about their equilibrium position. And if you monitor, if you look at these interface areas between liquid and solid, you will see how disorder increasing entropy propagates from the liquid into the solid. And although the solid fights for its life and tries to survive in that ordered state, it cannot because the temperature is above the melting temperature. Many phenomena in science, in engineering, but also maybe in social science proceed that way. Think how a larger country can invade a smaller one. How do they do that? From the from the borders. It doesn't happen at once. It doesn't, no change happens, boils in all the volume at one time. We learn from molecular dynamics that disorder propagates from the edges of the system until it takes over the, the entire volume. But why this, is this useful for thermodynamics? Because from the vibrations of the atoms about their equilibrium properties, we can calculate enthalpy. Enthalpy is a measure of the heat transported uh, absorbed or released by the system. So if we know the enthalpy, we can calculate, and I know all of you love math and doing integrals, and by thermal integration, we, by thermal integration, we can get the free energy by integrating enthalpy over a temperature square. And from that, as I mentioned, by derivation with respect to composition this time, we get a chemical potential and calculate the tangents to these figures. The thing is that in many systems, the number of phases we need to account for is huge. You cannot do that by hand anymore. You cannot do that with nine phases, like in this um, example I'm showing on the right, that change with temperature. So these are free energies evolving with temperature. Now imagine you would ask, you would attempt to do this yourself, or even ask a summer student to do it. Get a hundred curves and calculate all the common tangent between combinations of them. That is an outstanding task. Nobody wants to do that. Now think in three dimensions. You will have to find planes that are tangent to all the surfaces that represent free energy. So again, humans have some limitations in this area at least. And partnering with machines, with computers, with software, help them overcome these limitations. But then at some point, in fact, not so recent as you may think, a few decades ago, the idea that machines can learn and do some tasks by themselves appeared. And today, we are kind of collecting, harvesting the fruits of that tho those thoughts that evolved over time. And again, a bit of historical perspective. The Bayesian analysis that I'm going to describe briefly today started with the work of the Reverend Bayes. Reverend Bayes, a few hundred years ago, look at the date, 1760, 1750, he was, in fact, uh, in an abbey um, with other monks, and his interest was in winning at games. He liked to play games and wanted to win. And he made an observation that uh, to many was so obvious that uh, it's a wonder why is this seen as a, an important result in science. He said that, you know what, the more you play, the better you are at a game. And uh, he even proposed a mathematical formulation for that. He said, if I look at some models of playing a game, or if you translate that to thermodynamics, some models of your free energy or some models of the lines in the phase diagrams. I can assign a prior probability of these models to be correct. I don't know, a model coming from the University of Texas could be 80% correct, and the one from Argonne National Laboratory maybe only 60%. And uh, you can inv make an inventory of models and assign a prior probability of them to be correct. But then if you analyze the data you have, and you may have 30, 50, 100 data sets against these models and calculate the posterior probability for the models to be correct after looking at, at how well they represent the data. The results, the posterior probabilities may be very different. 
right? So University of Texas could be not 80%, but maybe 60, and Argonne could be even lower. Uh, and some un, uh, group that we thought originally that had a model that is not that good may turn out to be the provider of the best representation. So this idea that as you get more information, more data, and you analyze it, your models become better and better. Your representation of reality becomes better and better. It's a very powerful one. No, he didn't publish his results. He sent them to uh, Price, one of his colleagues, and uh, uh, to his uh, uh, credit Price, after uh, Reven Bass died, published the letters he received and gave all the credit to Reven Bayes. That's why we call this Bayesian method and that Price method, which would have created a lot of confusion, if you think about it. Now, how to use that in practice to analyze thermodynamic data? Here's an example. We are looking at over 200 uh, data points for a thermodynamic property. It doesn't even matter what that is. And we are trying to see what polynomial forms will fit this data the best. Is it a line, like degree one polynomial as shown here? Is it a parabola? Is it a cubic? Do we need more uh, higher degree polynomials or not? And using the Bay Bayesian analysis, we've been able to, to look at this information and determine that, in fact, a uh, line is a poor representation of this data set, while a parabola does pretty well. And in fact, if we increase too much the order of the polynomial, we may overfit. We can get a polynomial of degree 1,574 that will go through all the points we have in this figure, but will be of no use for making any prediction about the evolution of the system because it fits too well. The problem of overfitting leads to the impossibility of predict, of extrapolate. So we would like a representation of thermodynamic data or any uh, property of a system that is good enough to capture the essential elements of that system, but not too sophisticated to make it impractical for predictions. Now, regarding phase diagrams, it just happened that some years ago, that was in 2014 years ago, uh, I published a, a paper with one of my colleagues using Bayesian analysis to evaluate uncertainty of phase diagrams. It turned out it was one of the first papers that calculated uncertainty. And it was discovered a year ago by NIST, National Institute of Standard and Technology, that this was one of the first attempts and they organized a workshop. And I even forgot about this paper. I didn't pay much attention. I didn't know how... Uh, important it was, or uh, the fact that it was one of the few, I thought everybody will do this, it makes sense. So the interest in this work is now um, uh, high again, and uh, using Bayesian analysis and other methods, we are able now to uh, calculate uncertainty in phase diagrams. I, for the pleasure of those of you who want to do this in practice or want to learn in more detail, I listed here some of the equations we're using in the Bayesian analysis, but in essence, we, try, we use that model parameters, enthalpies of, and, uh, and melting temperatures of the two components, and then try to refine them using the Bayesian methodology, as I said. We used for that uh, diagram I showed you more than 20 data sets, eliminated some based on the analysis. And we can retrieve quite important information about the correlations between various data points that we have. And most importantly, we can determine those posterior probabilities of various models to be true. That's useful for those who uh, use phase stability in their work. Now, to evolve the parameters and, and uh, gain uh, a path towards optimization, we use genetic algorithms. That was in, in the paper I mentioned at the time. Nowadays, one can use other methods that can lead to op optimization in a multi-parameter space. But uh, I'm going back just for a bit to uh, hafnium oxide and show you how this methodology allows us to determine what is uncertainty in lattice parameters, for example, uh, which is one of the most important properties and information that we can retrieve about these crystals. And even make some predictions about 
the phase diagram, the uncertainty in the phase diagram. To do that, we use quantum mechanical calculations to get information that we don't have from experiments. For example, what are the mixing, what is the mixing enthalpy? If you mix oxygen and hafnia, what is the enthalpy? Everybody knows enthalpy of hafnia and one can calculate easily uh, uh, enthalpy of oxygen. But what if I have a mixture of 22.5% oxygen? In half? What is the enthalpy of that? Nobody knows. So we use quantum mechanical calculations to do that. And here is the result. I don't know if you can see it that well. We found that uncertainty, for example, in the transformation temperatures between monoclinic and tetragonal. So that would be here. This I would say it consistent with the experiment, with what most experiments will do, plus minus 50 degrees. As you go higher in temperature in this area, uh, so tetragonal to cubic, the uncertainty is higher. But then, for the melting point, so right here, it's smaller again. Why do you think that is? So based on the first results, couple of results, you would think that as you go higher in temperature, the, the errors in measurements and in calculations should be higher. And here is the thing. Many people have measured the melting point of hafnium oxide. So because there is so much information, the uncertainty dec decreases. Our confidence in the melting point of hafnia is higher than our confidence in this eutectic point, eutectic point in the middle of diagram, so right here. Because there is a lot of work that was done here and very few results in this area. Our analysis points that out. And this is a very useful information. Think of how this could guide research. Should you have all your results with uncertainty, confidence interval, you would know what would be a productive area of, for future research. If everybody knows this melting point, I'm not going to do another study. But since very few people have measured in this area, very, maybe nobody in this other part of the diagram, maybe that's where I should go with my research. And now. I'm just going to show you where to get this data if anybody really cares about it. And National Institute of Standard and Technology is a source, important source of such information. And I'm going to leave it to that. And go to the last part of my talk, which is, I think, the one that may be perhaps uh, the most controversial, but where I hope to engage you in a, in a discussion. Here's my opinion about how the role of computation has changed. I think it started with calculating numbers in the 50s. Have you seen the imitation game? Uh, yeah, Turing and everybody trying to get some numbers and, and, and uh, uh, try to understand the encryption system of Enigma. So after numbers and, and some help with plotting figures, editing documents was an important contribution that computers would make to uh, uh, the way we conduct research. I wrote my PhD thesis more than 20 years ago in WordPerfect. Nobody uses WordPerfect anymore, right? And it was quite good. And then, uh, maybe in the around 90s, simulations, computer simulations of all kinds, computational fluid dynamics, molecular dynamics, quantum mechanics came upon, and the computer started to help in a way that was far more meaningful, I would say. Numbers are good. Plotting, tabulating is fine, editing text is OK, but making simulations that predict the evolution of a system is far more important, I would say. And we are living now in a time where the role of computing is changing dramatically. Intelligent software could advise us, could be a partner in our research team. It's more than giving any numerical result. You can consult with a piece of software to determine what is the best course of an experiment or of a calculation. It becomes a team member of a research team. And that changes the landscape of, the, of science and technology. I think we are close to having an expanded version of the Mendeleev periodic table that includes not only elements, but mixtures, solutions, um, alloys, ceramics, multi-component heterogeneous structures. That is feasible and will happen maybe part of this initiative related to the materials genome. I also think that the connections between devices becomes more and more sophisticated and will exhibit elements of intelligence in itself. These devices will 
self-organize, communicate about themselves, maybe even be able to make some decisions and again, provide information to assist us in our daily life. This is a big change. Software goes beyond computing numbers with accuracy and precision. It becomes intelligent, becomes a member of the team. That, will, that impacts already our daily life. Look, I, I don't have, I have my smartphone in my uh, bag, and I do consult with my smartphone. All right? It tells me where to drive. It tells me what time is, I don't know what show. It tells me all kinds of things. And if you use any of the other personal assistants, you know that. But even more, at Argon National Laboratory, we have an immersive visualization lab where you can go and use 3D goggles like you would use for a game for applications that are far more complex than that. You could walk through virtually through a, a city, go on the streets, see what happens, what, uh, what uh, uh, stores are there, what art museums, what facilities, what venues. You can do even more than that. Visualizing is quite important. You can get contextual information for, for what you see. So the augmented reality to me is the area that will be the most fruitful in research in the near future. Imagine that you look at a building and the software tells you not only when it was built, but what architectural style that was and who was the architect and can give you all kinds of other information. With this progress come some ethical issues. My glasses right now could tell me, for each of you, what's your name, what university you are, what are your grades, who are your relatives, where you live, what's your social security number. <laughs> but I hope it's not going to go that way. But rather than becoming an enemy of humanity, computing and artificial intelligence will become a partner and a friend and our life will become even better and better due to this intelligent software that is bound to uh, appear. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions. Yes. So it seems that here you only study the uh, thermal dynamic equilibrium phase. So do you consider like uh, meta, meta phase? I didn't hear the last part of the question. Do I, I consider what? Uh, meta phase. Meta? Like, yeah, meta. So like if uh, in experiments, uh, sometimes people uh, they quench. Okay. So if you didn't hear, hear the question, thank you. very interesting question. Um, I presented only equilibrium phase diagrams that represent equilibrium states of systems, but metastability is also important in applications. And it is possible to calculate uh, metastable, uh, free energy of metastable phases. And when we do that, the free energy of those phases will appear higher than the free energy of the equilibrium ones. That is why when we draw the common tangent to get the chemical equilibrium, those phases don't appear in the equilibrium phase diagram. But as the, the, uh, our colleague pointed out very well, if we, do, if we go to, through a non-equilibrium process, for example, quenching, if you quickly quench a liquid, then you stabilize phases that otherwise could be metastable. Uh, cementite, for example, in the carbon-iron system, cementite is metastable. It doesn't appear in the phase diagram, but it can be obtained experimentally. Um, another example would be amorphous phases glass that can be obtained through quenching. It does not appear in uh, equilibrium phase diagram. So it's a very good point. M many systems, many processes are not at equilibrium. And that is okay. And that is fine. And we can apply correctly thermodynamics to retrieve these properties. So very good question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so for the next uh, periodic table with materials, um, obviously, the current periodic table is so small that you can just look at it and kind of have an idea. If you don't know what you're looking for, but you want a material with like certain properties, you can go to this section and whatnot. But how would practically people query this new generation of uh, periodic table to make something useful 
people that don't know the material they're looking for. I, I trust that everybody heard the question. Have you? Uh, so in essence, uh, uh, with the current periodic table, we can look at the rows and columns and find our elements and look at the properties. For the next uh, generation periodic tables that are in multi-dimensions with elements and mixtures and compounds, how are we going to visualize that or how are we going to query those properties? And it's a good question. It points out how important is visualizations for humans. We would like to see things, but we need to learn with cases when it's impossible to see them and just extract the information. It was somehow similar to what I said about phase diagrams. With two elements you can imagine, with three you can, with four you cannot anymore, with five or more you cannot anymore, but you can still extract the information. So to answer your question, I think there will be software that will return the properties of a chemical component that involves five or six elements without you being able to visualize a place in that multidimensional uh, periodic table, it will just give you, return back the property to you. Electronic structure, electronic bands, lattice parameters, thermal expansion, everything. So that new periodic table will be more like a knowledge base that you, where you would go and say, here's my chemical composition, return to me the following property, and it will. It may not be possible to visualize how that table, you cannot create a poster and put it on your wall. I don't know, maybe in one of these immersive visualization methodologies, you could dive into the poster with some 3D goggles and go to your chemical compound, whatever that is, but not the entire table as a whole. Yes? Uh, the phase diagram only tells you the face of the matter, like whether it's liquid or solid or whatnot. But most of the time when you perform some certain level of research, you want to know the properties, electromagnetic properties, uh, how well it uh, fractures its stiffness. So would you, how would you supplement that information, the information you actually want for your experiments? Would you need to go and perform all those experiments and all those uh, different combinations of compounds? Or can you do another simulation that will present those results and fill in the gaps? If you didn't hear the question, uh, thermodynamic information is fine, is good, but is not uh, all you need to understand the material. You may need mechanical properties, uh, microstructure information. Uh, so the question was, what do you do if you need all this information and all you have is the phase diagram? And uh, in fact, part of the answer was included in the question because at the very end, uh, our colleague suggested that, are you going to do more calculations? Are you going to do more measurements? Yes, that's, that's what we do. So uh, phase diagram is only equilibrium phase diagram information only tells you the initial and the final state, the equilibrium state of a mixture, of a composition in terms of thermodynamic properties, enthalpy, entropy, a measure of disorder. If you want to understand mechanical properties and even some chemical and electronic properties, you need to also look at microstructure how these atoms self-organized at mesoscale, at uh, length uh, scales uh, like 10 microns or 100 microns, uh, where the grains form, the grains evolve. What happens if you introduce a dopant? How will that change the electronic property uh, of, of that material? And as pointed out in the question, uh, more experiments are always useful and give us a sense that reality is better represented in the experiments, which I'm ready to debate with anybody who wants to discuss that. Computation can give information that experiments cannot. Sometimes it is impossible to do experimental work in certain temperature, pressure, conditions, and computation is the only source of information. In many cases, the best procedure is to do some calculations to reduce the number of experiments you must do instead of 200 possible combinations and properties. You do some calculations and determine that the most likely, the most fruitful or most, uh, the, the best option for you is to do just five experiments in this composition range, in this temperature range. So computers can guide a scientific team into areas that can be very rich for the research. It will not replace experimentation ever. It will 
guide. It will reduce, it will, it will point to the scientist where he's most likely to find their answer. Yes? So I agree with that take on what computation is in the whole picture. Um, but uh, so for some of these, these situations where you have lots of different elements, um, computation can be very expensive or, you know, if you want, it would be nice to have a, you know, interatomic potential for like, these systems, but they just don't exist. So you either need something like ab initio methods or maybe some kind of machine learning potential. So where, where do you see this bottleneck? Uh, do, you, do you think it's going to be critical that we have machine learning potentials or that um, ab initio methods need to become a lot faster so we can actually do these things faster? In yeah. essence, the question, which it's too bad you cannot hear these questions maybe uh, in the, their entirety because there are many good points, so summarizing is always difficult. But uh, uh, in essence, uh, uh, the point, very good point made by our colleague was that computation can be expensive, a lot of, in terms of computer time, in terms of money, in terms of people's time and the software development. And uh, uh, is it possible that maybe machine learning will uh, uh, become a more productive way of getting new information about these complex materials or s improving the high performance computing modeling and simulation that is going on in full force right now, uh, making that more efficient, uh, less in energy con uh, intensive, less costly. What is the balance between the two? And I, I would say that High performance computing and model and simulation and predictive analytics will not disappear. They will continue, they will improve, their efficiency will improve. However, it will never be possible in my lifetime and neither in your lifetime, although you guys are so young, I'm so jealous, to see a computer simulation, be it density functional theory or molecular dynamics even, that accounts for all the atoms in a meaningful sample or in a meaningful part in a device. We cannot compute everything. And that is why at some point machine learning can help by analyzing either a supervised way or an unsupervised way, and Prasanna has talked about that, I'm sure, uh, analyze the, the huge amount of data we have and extract meaningful models that have predictive capabilities without making it necessary to do high performance computing, high performance simulations and extensive calculations. So it is possible that as Bayes said, the more we looked at large data sets through the eyes of a software or of a computer, the better we understand their properties and the better our models become. And it's not, so I see an evolution of machine learning and elements of artificial intelligence beyond machine learning in parallel and somehow is now at a, at a slope that is higher than high performance computing and modern simulation, it may even surpass at some point. If you judge by the investments that are being made in artificial intelligence nowadays and in machine learning, it is foreseeable that at some point it will go way beyond what how much money and energy we put in high-performance computing. Very sorry for those of you who have your life depending on HPC, uh, but that will happen. And it's not a bad thing. And again, it doesn't mean that machine learning will replace modeling and simulation or high-performance computing or experiments for that matter, as I said. It's another partner in this complex research teaming up that is happening right now. Okay, thank you.